families are the result of adult people marrying and having children. Each child starts life as a single cell, which is the result of the joining together of sex cells from both its parents, a male cell produced by its father's body and a female one from its mother. But human parenthood implies more than this. From its parents, the child not only receives food and shelter, which are necessary, but also the security and affection that are essential for the child to develop happily. When human beings are very young, differences between the sexes do not seem so many or so obvious. Boys and girls are very much the same in the way their bodies work, and for many years they enjoy doing the same things in much the same way. But from the time they are about 11 years old, they begin to be aware of changes in themselves and the people around them. This period of development is known as adolescence, which means becoming adults. At this time, boys' voices change or break. The shape of the body alters. A man's body is more angular than that of a woman. Hair begins to appear on various parts of the body, more so in men than in women. These changes are associated with developments inside the body. Many things are happening to prepare the adult body for parenthood. Let us see something of how and why these developments come about and how they are controlled. Underneath the brain, we have a little gland. This is called the pituitary gland. At the time we are growing up, it begins to make chemical substances called hormones, which are carried in the bloodstream around the body to the male sex glands, or testes, in a boy, and the female sex glands, or ovaries, in a girl. Then the sex glands become active and produce substances which pass into the bloodstream and cause the changes which take place in people's bodies as they become adults. As the boy becomes a man, the hormones also stimulate the production of male sex cells in the male sex glands, the testes, which are outside the body. Inside each testis are coiled tubes. We have unraveled one and pulled it to one side. These coiled tubes are lined with cells. From these lining cells, the male sex cells develop by division of the cells. They are called sperms. Each has a head portion and a tail. Inside the head portion is a special kind of nucleus. Fluids are produced by other glands in the man's body, and when the sperms are fully ripe, they swim in these fluids by means of their tails. The sperms and fluid make up semen. The sperms escape from the body in large numbers through a tube leading through the penis. During this time of adolescence, female sex cells begin to ripen inside the girl's body. Instead of testes, she has two ovaries, lying each side of an organ called the uterus, or womb, which is hollow. This opens into a passage called the vagina, which opens to the outside of the body. It is in the ovaries that the female sex cells, the egg cells, are produced. They begin to ripen during adolescence. We find the young egg cells underneath the thin outer skin of the ovary, and usually one egg cell ripens at a time. It is prominent because it is much larger than the cells around it. Some of these form a double jacket round the egg cell. The egg cell takes about 14 days to ripen completely. As it does so, fluid collects between the inner cells of the jacket. This fluid increases in amount so that finally the egg cell comes to lie in a little hillock of cells to one side of a little bag or sac. By this time, the mass of cells with the egg cell has come to lie deeper in the tissue of the ovary. The cells are stretched by the fluid so that the sac gets larger as the egg cell ripens. It appears as a little hump 
covered with cells to one side of the space inside the sac. From now on, pressure of the tissues forces the sac towards the surface of the ovary, where it forms a little bulge. Then, about 14 days after the egg cell began to ripen, the little sac bursts, owing to the pressure of the fluid inside it, and the egg cell is set free into the space inside the body. It might well get lost, but movements of the frilly ends of the tubes leading to the womb occur at this time when the egg cell is escaping from the ovary. They help to ensure that the egg enters the tube. The egg cell begins to travel towards the womb. During sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, sperms are placed in the vagina of the woman by the penis of the man. From there, the sperms travel through the hollow space inside the womb and along the tubes leading from it. If this happens when an egg cell is in the tube, the sperms will eventually reach the egg cell. The ripe egg cell is surrounded by a jelly-like layer, and like the sperm cell, it has a special kind of nucleus. As the sperms come near to the egg cell, they swim to it in large numbers. Eventually, one wriggles through the jelly layer and enters the egg cell itself. The egg cell is then fertilized, or complete, and after this happens, it is able to divide again and again to form more cells, which stay grouped together inside the jelly membrane. Presently, instead of a single fertilized cell, there is quite a ball of cells, which from now on is called an embryo. All the time the cells are dividing, the embryo is slowly moving down the tube towards the womb. Meantime, the lining of the womb has been prepared for the arrival of the embryo. The tissue lining the womb contains glands with little blood vessels or capillaries running between them. glands and blood vessels lengthen during the time the egg cell is passing down the tube. From the blood in the blood vessels, the cells lining the glands obtain substances that are converted into food materials that pass down the glands and out into the hollow space inside the womb. Here are the mouths of the glands in surface view. When the embryo drifts into the womb, the food substances and oxygen provided by the lengthened glands seep into it. So the cells continue to divide. The embryo presently develops into a hollow ball of cells. The jelly layer around it disappears and the naked ball of cells becomes attached to the wall of the womb. It sinks in among the tissues of the mother's womb. For many weeks more, it stays in the womb, gradually developing into a baby. As its organs and tissues develop, the baby slowly grows larger. With the new membranes around it, it forms quite a large bulge on the inside surface of the womb. Elsewhere in the mother's body, preparations are taking place for the birth of the baby inside glands which are developed in the chest region called breasts. Branched tubes lead to an opening at the nipple. During adolescence, these branches increase in number. When a woman is pregnant, or going to have a baby, chemical substances from various glands in her body stimulate the glands in the breast, and they become even more branched at the tip. By the time the baby is born, the cells lining the tips of the glands produce droplets of a fluid, which passes down the branched channels as the milk. This development of a woman's breast means that she is able to feed her child for some months after it is born.
So for some time after birth, the child is still fed with food supplied by the mother's body. A few weeks after the baby is born, its mother's womb has recovered its normal size. Presently, a new egg cell begins to ripen in one of the ovaries again. When a woman is not pregnant, an egg cell ripens in the ovaries every month or so. A normal woman may produce nearly 500 ripe eggs in the years between adolescence and middle age. Then the production of eggs is less frequent and ceases during a period known as the change of life. These eggs burst from the ovary when ripe and move along the tube leading towards the womb. In most cases, these eggs are never fertilized. This is what happens when they are not, and the woman is therefore not pregnant. The lining of the womb regularly prepares for the arrival of an egg, just as if it were fertile or complete. Each time, the lining layer with its glands and blood vessels increases in thickness. Food substances pour out of the glands. But if an unfertilized egg cell arrives in the womb, it will be dead or will die shortly after arrival, so it does not become attached to the wall of the womb. When this happens, all the lining tissues break down. The glands, blood vessels and all are discharged from the body. Only the original stumps of the glands and blood vessels remain. This loss of blood-stained tissue is called the monthly period, or menstruation, as it takes place every month or so in girls and adult women. It is connected with the regular ripening of the egg cells when women are not pregnant. The flow of blood and other materials from the womb to outside the body is called the monthly flow, or period, and usually lasts four to five days. Meantime, another egg cell has been ripening in the ovary, and the glands and blood vessels in the lining are renewed. They begin to pour out food materials once more, in case the egg should arrive in the womb in a fertilized state. But if, at the end of a month or so, another unfertilized egg cell enters the womb, it will not become attached to the lining. This once more breaks down. The tissue material leaves the body, and we speak of another period as having begun. This more or less regular monthly cycle takes place until, from middle age, the production of ripe eggs gradually ceases. Sometimes, a woman's ovaries may produce two ripe eggs at the same time, which travel towards the womb. If they should each be fertilized by a sperm cell entering them, two babies conceived at the same time will grow inside the mother's womb. Each child has its own placenta attached to the wall of the womb, and each is enclosed in a separate little bag or membrane. Such children, born at the same time, we call twins. But they need not be any more alike than brothers and sisters born separately, as they develop after two eggs have been fertilized by two sperms. They may not even be of the same sex, as one of each of the two kinds of sperms may each have fertilized an egg. But sometimes, two embryos may arise from a single fertilized egg cell. These children nearly always share the same placenta and are enclosed together in the same thin, membranous bag. They are called identical twins and are always of the same sex. They resemble each other far more than ordinary brothers and sisters. In ways like this, we can also explain by triplets, or quadruplets, like these children, or even, very rarely, quintuplets may be born. <laughs>